underneath every business or sales transaction, there is a human interaction that's going on. And this goes beneath the higher brain where we're intellectual and we're rational and we're making decisions, that sort of thing. And it goes to the lower brain um, that uh, Paul McLean kind of call, calls the primitive brain that whoever controls the social interaction controls the financial transaction. And I'm 100% showing everybody in that room without having to be dom dominant, without having to be rude, without having to be overbearing. I'm showing everybody in that room who's in charge. Welcome back to another episode of Seven Figure Music School, where we're flipping the script today. I'm going to be introducing and interviewing Daniel on a very important part of every single music school's business, which is the sales process. Looking forward to this one. This is, uh, this is a very important topic. This is your area of expertise too. And so let me just tee this up by saying that at, at Brooklyn Music Factory, we're actually expanding our enrollment team from one to four salespeople right now. We're literally there. We just brought them on. And so I am in particularly interested in getting your wisdom on this. And so we're going to talk specifically about how to move uh, a parent from inquiry to enrollment and all mm. these, these very specific steps that you have um, in the sales process. So where do you want to start on this one, Daniel? Mm, it's a good question. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, fire. You've got these four people. What do you feel that they most need to be successful at their job right now? Like if they were to listen to this episode, what would you want them to hear? But I want these salespeople to understand that they don't have to make it up every time, that they can follow mm. a, a specific set of steps and walk through the qualification of this parent all the way to the point of getting their credit card, getting them scheduled and feeling confident call after call. I mean, I think that's what I would love to take away. And uh, in mm. truth, Daniel, I'll likely send them this episode to listen yeah, to. I knew you would. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, then let's start with, let's say, some mindsets for success. First off, um, sales, there is creativity involved. But in my opinion, this should not be a creative process. Mm. A successful sales process, as you were mentioning, a successful sales process does not reinvent itself. It is Bach. It is not Coltrane. <laughs> okay. It is it is classical music. It is not jazz. And so something that I think every everyone should they should start with the mindset that they need to map this process out. Mm. They need to know that it's going to be the exact same way essentially every single time. I think people are surprised when they find that when, when I've worked with people closely and, and worked on their processes with them, their sales process with them, how I didn't necessarily have a completely written out script, but I had an outline. I had a script outline and I, you know, I might choose different words, but actually for about the last eight years that I was still running my studio, Every single meeting I had with a new family was essentially the same. And I didn't get bored doing it. And I got into these patterns and I even recorded myself at times and found myself emphasizing the same words, using the same tone of voice at different parts. And it's just like, if you want a reliable and predictable outcome, you have to do reliable and predictable things the entire way through that process. Can we go to the second one? Yeah, yeah. Are we still on mindsets? Another still mindset? on mindset. Okay, yeah, sweet. The, Lay it on the, it. this is a mindset, that, and I think it's a very close follow on to what I said here before. But be comfortable with the fact that you do need to start this process with a blank piece of paper, or an empty Word doc, or a note in your favorite note taking app, or to, you know uh, whatever that might be, whether it's Evernote or the Notes app on your iPhone, whatever it is, and just understand that. If you want to be successful at this, you need to do what I described earlier. And that is to script this out bit by bit. And when I say script it, I don't mean that you're writing every single word you're going to say, but, you're, but that you are 
anticipating, visualizing, writing down the process from first call, as you said, to when they sign up. And in reality, this episode is going to be about what I think those best practices are. Like, I do want to get into the detail of the things that I did, because the third thing is, is that it is simple. And this is probably the final thing I'll say, that you don't need a complex process. And I recently went through this, and I'm just going to drop the name here again, but I recently went through this last year with my ops manager, Kirsten, when we were designing out the sales process for grouplessons.com, Piano Express, mm, yep. that... We were designing something from the ground up and we simultaneously were having to figure out how that sales process interacted with our website and the various ways we were going to be doing digital marketing. It was a very complex design. And I ended up writing a multi-page document about how how the sales flow was going to go. And it felt at first overwhelming and complex to me. And over time, I saw the things that I could jettison and kick out. And it's become a simpler process over time. I kind of over-engineered it at first, despite my best efforts at making it as simple as possible. But I just didn't have as much data as I did after doing a ton of calls to people who eventually signed up you know, to, to do group lessons the way that we're teaching. Point being is that you do your best job on your first pass through. It probably will be a little bit complex. But then over time, you begin to see, oh, th- these are the things that absolutely must be done and communicated. And again... I don't think a piano studio sales process has to be even as complex as this most recent thing that I designed. It's actually working very, very well. Um, I only mentioned that to just say that I know what I'm talking about here, you know, and I think that you probably won't have to deviate very much from what I have to share here over the next 30 to 45 minutes. Like you probably can take this basic outline and make some tweaks to make it fit your studio. So those are the three mindsets. Questions, uh, Nate? So let's jump straight in. And I know when we were chatting about it a little bit before, mm-hmm. you 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 kind of focused on a couple of areas. The uh, it sounds like the first of which was just the actual sales call, mm-hmm. and like what's going to happen when a parent calls or they fill out that inquiry form and you you get them on the phone. You yeah. want to start there? Yeah, um, I think that's helpful. Let me, even before we go into that, let me outline what I think the process should be. I just want to give a very high level view so that as you hear for the rest of the time that you can put each individual thing you're hearing into into a contextual whole. Otherwise, it's just like you're getting all this information out of context and you've got to keep it straight in your brain. So basically this, in the digital world, you are in some way going to collect a lead. And even if you collect the lead in an analog way, you are going to digitize it. So a couple episodes back, we we did an interview with Brian, and he talked about generating leads in, in local events or through networking and referrals. Even if you're getting, ha- if, even if you have a clipboard with phone numbers and names and emails on it, you're putting that into a CRM more than likely. Yeah. And and the point that I'm getting at is that we all start in that same place with those names or getting a phone call and those go into a digital framework. What happens after that point? Well, I'm wanting people to do a couple things consistently. You need to toggle between or or kind of do these things in a row. Phone call, email, text, phone call, email, text, or phone call, text, email. Like there's no magic to the order. I still prefer to try to reach out to people by phone. It's a little more analog. It's a little more old fashioned, but you're going to start building rapport and relationship with people over the phone. So much more is connect, uh, communicated that way. Um, I will say that probably the most effective way to get in touch with people is text. And I would say use text to make the connection and then set up the phone call or the trial where you can make that human connection. But in some ways, I preferred, even if I could tell the person was really, really motivated to get in the lessons, I still wanted to talk to them a little bit before they came in because I could screen out people that I didn't want to work with yep, that's the by having a phone call. Piece. Yeah. So anyway, I'm getting a little bit too much in the weeds here. Let me go back to the high level and just describe the process. You get the lead. You, in some way, get in touch with that lead, set up the phone call, which then sets up the trial. And then at the trial, you set up the first lesson And then you use some sort of communication in between then and the first lesson to make sure they show up at the first lesson. That is my simple process. I'm going to say it again. Collect the lead, put them in your CRM, 
connect with them, set up a phone call. The phone call is designed to get people into the trial or the open house. Or if you don't do a trial or open house, maybe the phone call is it, you know, um, so that could be an intermediary step that I added into my process. If you don't have it, you can jump straight from the phone call to the first lesson. But phone call, trial, follow up, lesson, years of lessons afterwards. That's the process. Dig it. The part of the process that we're going to focus on today, I think, is just how do you make the most out of those two really important one to one personal communication? aspects of that process the phone call and then the trial lesson like to me that's what i felt like you were saying that you wanted to focus on nate is that correct yeah yeah and i like that you outlined it there and um for our listeners like at brooklyn music factory we no longer do a free trial but we do risk-free reg- registration so you have two weeks of risk-free registration that's which cool is essentially acting as kind of the same it idea. is it is acting as the trial yes it's such yeah. a great idea and if you're willing to because you're it's so much more powerful for people to have a taste of the experience, to have an experience of you. They're far more likely to say yes. And so to say risk-free registration, they actually just go into the week to week lessons. It feels like the experience they're going to be having for years to come. And then they often just stay, you know? Yeah. And they just stay. And so, so yeah, I love it. Let's start with the, um, we're, we've made the connection. We've right. maybe we've texted them and they've committed to a phone call and now we have them on the phone. Maybe we yes. start there. Yeah. Absolutely. And so the very first thing I have to say about this is I want to highlight the difference between selling sales with a capital S and selling lessons. Mm. There's this process called sales and then they're selling lessons. Mm. And the mistake I've seen some people make is assuming that a general sales training, it does prepare you for selling lessons, but there are some, there are some, Subtleties, some nuances I think that people should understand about the process of selling lessons versus just sales in general. Because if you go out and you listen, (laughs) if you're anywhere from the most authentic guy like a Zig Ziglar or, you know, someone old school Mm. or a very relational based selling all the way to Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, (laughs) Mm. you know, there's this, there's this range of sales training out there. There's, you know, and if you're serious about about getting good at conversion. I mean, let's be honest. If you're a studio owner and you haven't listened to at least one thing on sales, what are you doing? So you need to listen to something. (laughs) And I mean, you might not think about it that way, but you really should. So some sort of general sales training. But what I will say in general is that the thing that's different about selling lessons versus the way sales is primarily taught is that there really isn't a pain point in the way that traditional sales techniques utilize Mm. that piece in sales training. Every sales training I've taken has really emphasized that piece. They say, Ooh, this is the key to making your sales. But for most parents, they're not enrolling their kids because they have this giant pain point. So if you go into this process thinking that you've got to sell this hard and you've got to be selling the pain and all that sort of thing, there's going to be a disconnect between the parent and you and your conversion will suffer from it. And so I have something that I've switched out from those traditional pain point talking points, something else that takes the place of that. And I just wanted to say that before we go into this process, because I know probably not a lot of people that are listening to this have listened to sales training. But if you do after this, you're going to find that you're going to feel that it feels like a little, like a little bit of a disconnect. Like I'm, I've literally had people say this to me, I'm not selling cars here. Not that there's anything yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. I'm not selling cars here, Daniel. I feel so disingenuous. I feel icky when I try to sell piano lessons or, or my voice lessons or whatever it is. I feel gross. I'm just saying like, hey, this process I'm not ready to describe shouldn't make you feel gross at all. It's actually really authentic. And it switches out some of those aspects of sales that I think most people object to, not because we're not, not because we don't want to do hard things, but just because it's not the most effective thing in what we're selling here. So I wanted to start with that. Daniel, I, I totally appreciate that because I am one who has Zig Ziglar in my, like in my audio books. I am one who's read some sales training books and I have gone to my sales team over and over and been like, we need to really focus in how can we reframe the pain point? And they're all mm. like, the resistance has been massive. 
And in truth, <clears throat> it, I've kind of felt in my gut, I'm like, this feels kind of weird to try mm. to figure out what this mom's pain point is. The only one I could ever come up with was you just don't want your kids' lessons to be like the ones you had as a child where you mm. quit after three years. So I'm like, yeah. okay, well, that is a pain point, I guess. But at any rate, I'm relieved to hear mm. you're going to give us an alternate path because yeah. uh, as will Jessica and the rest of our enrollment team, they'll be relieved too. Okay, cool. Now, there's one more thing. And I promise you, I am going to get into that framework eventually. I know we started with mindset. We talked about the difference between sales and selling lessons. There is one more thing I think that needs to be talked about right here at the outset before we jump into that actual step-by-step process. And I think this is important. And that's what's at stake. Because if you do this process right, versus if you do this process or don't have wrong or don't have a process, you will have very different outcomes. And I'm not just talking about the difference between them saying yes and no. It's actually mm-hmm. possible for them to say yes, but the way that you brought them into the studio actually sets, sets them up for failure or sets them up for a less than satisfactory experience, or sets them up with them feeling as if they're the one in charge or they're the one in control, and they vastly underappreciate or undervalue your lessons versus what is possible if you do this right, which is for them to have an enormous amount of respect for you and excitement for the lessons and appreciation and love for the studio. If you get this right, and it really goes back to what I was saying earlier, You know, there's that old phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Hmm. Yeah. And it goes back to how we, how the very first thing that I brought up, which is you have to map this out. And so that's, I think, the segue into actually talking about that, the basic framework for either the phone conversation and then the the trial lesson or the open house, just like a basic step-by-step, do this, do this, do this, do this. And if you'll follow this framework, I think you'll find that you'll, you're more confident. They're more excited. They share the the mission with you. They share the vision with you. You guys are on the same page. And now you've got a co-participant. If you're teaching kids, you have a co-participant in the parent, an ally in the parent versus what kind of is typically the cliche in our industry, which is we kind of see parents as the adversary at mm. worst and at best, they're just kind of like this person there that pays us, you know, yeah, as opposed to, to yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally. Okay, so cool. we got a step by step on the sa- phone sales to begin with. Is that right. what we're going next? Yes. Love yeah. It. And to be clear, I'm not talking about like the desk worker at your school picks up the phone and someone asks, like, oh, hey, um, do you guys do piano lessons there? Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this person is an actual lead. They filled out a form, they've entered their name on a clipboard somewhere, or you know, you've gotten them through one of your landing pages, and now you're following up. And the intention is to call to get them into the trial. And I will say that the difference between the kind of the phone sales aspect and how you would talk to them in a trial lesson or an open house. There is some overlap, but there are different goals there. And so I actually will treat those separately. Okay. So basic framework for that phone conversation is this. I'm just going to rattle off what to do in order. And then we can kind of unpack what each one of those things means if you want to, Nate. So here's what happens. Um, You dial the number, they pick up, you introduce yourself. And then what you want to do on that call, you don't want that call to end without these things happening. One, you need to build rapport with them. Two, you need to be clear about how the phone call itself will work. So you and I'm going to explain why that's important in a second. Three, you need to understand them. Four, you need to gather data and cause pain. Five, you need to bring in an emotion. And six, you need to ask for the trial and actually get them to commit to a time. And I, I'm going to keep saying trial because that's what I did in my studio. But trial can really be substituted for anything. Um, open house, you know, group lesson. In your case, Nate, you have the, um, you have the, the two-week risk-free. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. What would you call it again? Yeah, risk-free registration. So oh, I love that name. But what I hear you saying is you're moving from the call to getting them to physically come in, to commit to coming into your space right. in whatever form that is. But even though you wouldn't consider it a trial, I would still say risk-free registration. It's, it, 
that's important for them to understand that they're not committing to saying yes forever. This is just like a, they're, they're saying yes to the first date, so to speak. And so that's actually important for the purposes of this, for, for this framework. So those were the kind of six steps there. Do you want me to just walk through what I do on those? Do you want to yeah, ask me questions love, about it? Like what, what, what would be most helpful? I think maybe just, I think what's helpful here for our listeners is probably like not too many, but a couple tips on how, for example, mm. let's start with step one. Just you build rapport. Right. What have you found? You, you talked before about how um, it's, it's consistent from call to call. Do you have two or three things that you do consistently to build rapport that you found to be effective and feel authentic to you? Yeah. So I always start by introducing myself and mentioning within the first five to 10 seconds that I'm returning their call or that they had filled out my form and I was returning their call. And I like, I like the cadence of starting the same way every time. So I had a few things that I would say because what I want to do during that is I want it to feel like a volley. I want mm. I want there to be like um, this interaction. I don't want to just talk at them, and I don't want an awkward pause because I say something and they're supposed to answer. That's a hard answer. And this might seem this might seem like way too in the weeds, but it, I think it's actually important. Important energetically, we want there to be this this light playfulness in over over top of the call. So if you start like really strong and heavy and that sort of thing, unless you're selling like really like premium or high price lessons or something like that, that's really not the way to go. So I would always start, and this might seem silly by just saying like, Hey, is this a good time for you? I would just ask that. That's a very easy yes or no question for them. And most of the time it was a yes. If it was ever a no, I'd say, Hey, when can I call you back? And I literally have had calls where I asked that. And when I asked that question, they would say no, and I would ask, when's a good time to call? And I could feel the tension in their voice releasing. Like I could feel over the phone that they were so grateful that I wasn't just going to push through. Mm. And then and then I could feel the tension go away and then hear them lighten up and even laugh a little bit. Like, like I noticed that. And so, so you know, in, in terms of that building rapport, I would ask a couple little quick questions right at the beginning that were really easy for them to answer. Is this still a good time to talk? Yes. Awesome. Well, it looks like you were reaching out about piano lessons. Right. In other words, you're like, Nate, for the next five minutes, this is what right. we're going to do. And mm-hmm. you sort of, So what would you say specifically for here's how a call is going to work? Right. Well, then I'm just going to say like, hey, I've just got a couple questions for you. And, um, and then I imagine you have some questions for me. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about my piano lessons. Does that sound okay with you? Like, it's literally that simple. Right. Um, so you don't, just to be clear, you wouldn't go walk them all the way through the point of, and so then the last thing we'll do is schedule your trial. You don't say right. that. You, you don't take no. the finish line on the call. No. I, I wouldn't get that forward until I was closer to the end of the call. And I was actually certain that they that they were going to that I wanted to work with them or I wanted them to right. come in for a They're trial. Like, like, yeah. Yeah. You had qualified yeah. them. Okay. Love yeah. it. So I'm going to ask you a few questions Sure. and I'm sure you're going to have a couple questions for me. And then I love how you validate that by saying, does that sound good to you? Yes. Shall we uh-huh. get started? Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then we're on to understanding them, which sounds yes. like this is the sort of the meat of the matter here. Yep. And I would say one of the, one of the things I would ask, and again, I was stumbling on my words a little bit a minute ago because it occurred to me that I I really mix these first three in some ways because in reality, this understanding them thing is actually just a continuation of the rapport. Right. And so I would, the the question I almost always asked right after I told them how the call would work is, Hey, did you ever take lessons as a kid? Yep. Nate, I'm pretty sure you do this too. Yeah. Yeah. We do this. Yeah. We do a version of this. So I would ask them that. And what that does is gets them talking and gets them to kind of loosen up because they'd say yes or no. And then if they said yes, I would um, ask them like, okay, hey, could you you mind telling me a little bit about your lessons? If they said no, then we would just kind of skip to the next part. But I would like to hear what they had to say about that. Um, When they finished telling that story, I'd say like, okay, cool. All right. And, you know, I would react to things that they said there. And I'd say, well, um, why do you want to? 
why do you want to you know have your child take lessons basically so why do you want to have sarah take lessons well you know and then they would kind of give some kind of can pat answer and this is really where it's hard nate in this format what we're doing here mm. to to get deep in on this point and the next point because i had no script for this 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 is the point at which I know I said earlier that this isn't a creative process. It's not a creative process. The process was the same. But the individual aspects of the process, especially the next two, understanding them and then kind of gathering data slash causing pain, um, is uh you you real this is the one area where you have to really react in the moment to the things that they're saying. Because you just wouldn't know what they were gonna say. You don't and, and it would all be dependent on the age of that child, the the goals of the parent, which, of course, I'm going to ask about. So in understanding them, I'm going to ask them why they want Sarah in lessons. Um, and then as I'm unpacking that sort of thing, I'm beginning to see the I'm beginning to see the narrative that's forming. So instead of me like giving an exact script for what step three and four should be, here's what I'm here's what I'm searching for. I'm searching for the goal that they have and the thing they're afraid of. So let's, can we do some examples around that? Because I think sure. the gap, we're talking about gathering data right now. Mm -hmm. This is the data data piece. <laughs> so, and then the causing pain, I think that's the, um, Oh, I can tell you what that is. Yeah. Yeah. I once I know what, touched on it. well, once I know what they're afraid of, then I know what to highlight for them. Okay. So, so let's do some examples. Sure. Like maybe if you, I know you're digging back in the memory banks, so you have to go into the file cabinet now. <laughs> but like, <laughs> can you give me the give me a sample like example one of a goal a parent might have, and then a fear she might share? Can you? You got anything? Right. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, over the years, what you'll notice is that there's a lot of similarities between parents. There's probably only three to five goals and three to five fears. Mm. Um, and so yeah. over time, then you can just know the story you're going to tell, depending on which one shows up. And maybe sometime in a future episode, if we, if we're really running out of topics, Nate, maybe we just go in and talk about what those three to five fears are yeah. and three to five goals and, and all that. I'd really have to do some serious prep for that one. Uh, <laughs> Let's come up with one example that so that yeah. we can walk through the process. Yeah, of, of course. Yes. Um, so a goal that a parent might have would just be, oh, you know, I want them to just have a really well-rounded childhood. Another one was, oh, I took lessons. I think it's important. I think they should take lessons too. A variation of that one is, oh, you know, I want them, I want them to stick with something. So they're kind of using piano to build character. I want a skill that they'll be able to enjoy. I want them to have a skill they'll be able to enjoy their entire life. Another one I noticed from parents was, well, you know, this one's hard. These particular parents often express this in different ways, but the bottom line was they were almost viewing it as like, did my child hit the talent lottery? Like I want to discover if my child has talent. Mm, yeah, totally. They're using almost they're almost using the lessons as like a, an assessment. Yes. L like yeah. their their hope, you know, like I'm trying to find my child's thing. Uh, so yeah. many parents, oh, we tried them in sports, they didn't do good at that. We tried them in art, they weren't good at that. And so we're just kind of going down the the list and hitting the check boxes. They hated martial arts. Maybe they'll like piano lessons, you know, like they never got I found that the one. green belt. Yeah. Or wait, what's the first belt? Anyways. Oh man, I don't even know. <laughs> yellow, I think it is. Isn't it yellow? Yellow, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, then uh, those yeah. are great goal examples. I feel like we might be able to come up with two or three years. <laughs> oh mean, yeah. I know. I know the big ones. The big one is just, I'm, oh, I'm afraid they'll, the, the, they, they'll quit, that they won't stick with it which is an interesting thing to be afraid of. I'm just going to make a little aside here. How are you, how are you afraid that something that hasn't even happened yet is going to happen? Like that's like, <laughs> right, that, totally. that's like, that's like being scared of the shadow of a ghost. Anyway. anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah. So totally. there's that one. There, uh, another fear that came up over time was that they were afraid that it was going to cause fights. Yeah. Like, interesting. 
uh, you know, well, they, they never expressed it as that. It was always like, ah, oh, you know, I'm just concerned that it's going to be a point of tension that oh, they totally, won't, yeah. that they <laughs> won't want to practice and that, you know, that it'll be a, they wouldn't use the term point of tension, but that's in reality what they were saying. That's just my paraphrase. Um, you know, the one we get here, we get a oh, I'd love to hear. all the time, which is like, um, we, we, I just want it to be fun as mm. if their child's not actually having fun in the rest of their life or something. I don't know. But no, yeah. actually, we also get mm. this one, which is um, oftentimes parents will come to us at Brooklyn Music Factory and be like, the lessons I had as a kid sort of failed me, and I want to make mm. sure I do it differently this time. Like, I don't want my child to quit. It's a variation on the don't want my child to quit fear. Okay, Nate, I like how you said that, and I just went into killer mode, okay? Let's move to the next step by actually dealing with that, because I want to show, I want to show everyone who's mm. watching or, or listening how I would deal with that, because this yeah. is where you get into the cause pain, gather data cause pain. So, Nate, uh, and this is just me asking you, I'm not role-playing yeah, yeah. here, but could you say that one more time? What was the one, that last one you just said? Yeah, the last one is parents say, I had lessons as a child, mm -hmm. and I quit. They weren't fun. They failed me. And I want to be sure this time around with my own kid that that doesn't happen with them, that they okay. have a different kind of lesson. So mentally, everyone who's listening or watching right now, I want you to, ju we're just going to take a beat here. I want you to think about how you would respond to that. Just think about it for a second. If you want to pause the episode, just hit the pause button. Just make sure you unpause it after you're done. Okay. Think about, what you need to say to counteract that essentially objection. So I'm going to tell you that if you came up with something to say, no matter what it is, you're doing it wrong. You don't say anything to that because you don't know what you're talking about yet. And this is where I feel like most people get this process wrong because they're too quick to jump in with information, they're too quick to jump in with a reassurance when you don't even know what they mean yet. Because what, what I think of when I hear that is I need to ask a question. Why wasn't it fun for you? That's exactly what I would say next. Why wasn't it fun for you? Yeah. Get them talking. And what I would say is if you take nothing away from this episode, other than what I'm about ready to say, this is, I think, the the killer hack. This is the, the tasty tip, you know, and that is you, you need to get them to define everything. And the only way you can do that is to ask a lot of questions. When they yeah. say that they want their child to have fun, you need to understand what that means. Yeah. When they yeah. say you, you need to get them to define every ambiguous word and everything that they say and, and get that all out on the table. That's part one. If, if we're going to really boil this down to some big overarching ideas, the, the first part is you got to get them to define everything. You got to ask a lot of questions. And then two, once you, you unpack all that, your, your job is really easy. Then you just start mixing and matching what it is that your studio does well, which of course you've already done your homework and you know your offer really well and you know what you're good at and you know the tangible thing the tangible measurable things that children can do or adults can do after having spent a year with you three years with you five years with you of course you know all that right you've written it all down and if you have then the job's really easy and you get you get better at this over time and this is where i would often say the same things to harken back to the very beginning of the episode and that is this that you just take the fear and you say not this bluntly but after you've asked a lot of questions you just take the fear and say like, oh, interesting. You know, let me tell you, I had a similar experience, Mama Mary, uh, Daddy Dave. I had a similar experience when I was a kid. I had this teacher and, um, and then I start telling my personal story. And, said, and then what I would always say personally was, and when I started teaching lessons, I made a commitment that I was not going to do that thing that I hated so much. Yeah, totally. And so what I do here is this. And what you do is you start connecting the thing they're afraid of 
with a plausible, believable thing that you do that makes it seem like, oh, they've addressed that. Yeah, you know. And, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to – I want to highlight one thing you said and then, and then keep – without interrupting your train, but that – you're saying you're asking more and more questions. You're getting them to define mm -hmm. the, the experience that they had and the concerns that they have in language because you want to know the language they're using, mm -hmm. right? That's what I hear you saying. They're like, it wasn't fun for me because my teacher sat across the room and scowled at me the whole time or whatever that story is, you know? And so you're gathering all this data and it sounds to me like you're actually in that next stage where you're bringing in the emotion and the stories mm -hmm. you're you're asking them to tell you stories and then you're framing um some of their stories in your own experience you're sharing your own story um and you're connecting those dots with and this is the key i think this is where i think you were what you were citing before daniel is we go to features way too soon we begin talking way too soon in the in the call right mm -hmm. we go to like well, actually, Brook and Music Factory is a game-based songwriting approach without even actually hearing their story first. Right. You know, we're mm -hmm. like, like, here's a solution. Well, the problem, it sounds like, and I think you're going to get to this uh, when you get to how do, you, how do you sort of close that call. But the challenge what, that I always see is that a parent can't actually relate how games have anything to do with their fear. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what I hear you saying. Like they don't understand that like a songwriting approach actually may be a solution mm -hmm. because they're, they haven't had a chance to actually really flesh out their story. So yeah, don't talk too soon. Love it. Love connecting to what you do well in a studio. Um, and, and so you were in the middle of saying, so, so you were in the middle of saying like, how do you put all of these things together? And yeah. Sort of like, tie a bow around them and move them through the next to the next step. You know, and so that's really where we get back to, I can't necessarily give everybody here the thing that they need to say about their particular program. Mm. But what I know is that I kept coming up against kind of the same fears and the same goals. And I began asking myself, and again, this is the value of doing the same thing the same way every time, because then you start you start hearing the same things back from different people. And then you can actually start innovating based on that. Like, oh, wow, I'm being the same. So this is actually a valid, um, this is actually a valid test. It's statistically significant because I keep being the same and I keep hearing the same thing back from them and they're not talking to each other. And so right. this is actually how I came up with my group lesson method because I kept hearing the same fears. I was like, I need to design something so that I can plausibly address these concerns and fears. I keep hearing people saying like the kids aren't practicing enough at home. Oh, I don't want practice to be a fight. And so the very early, the very early stages of, of um, my group lesson career came out of the, as a response to me doing this in this way and, and, right. and beginning to connect the dots you know, and I'll just say, like, if you have your own program that you've designed or you're just teaching, you know, out of method books for the instrument that you teach, you are going to have to do a little more homework. Now, I'm going to drop a little bit of a commercial in here because this podcast is sponsored by not only mm. grouplessons.com, but also by Big Music Games from Brooklyn Music Factory. If you license or use a program that you get from somewhere else, such as Big Music Games or such as Piano Express from grouplessons.com, a lot of times the progenitors, the creators of those systems know their system inside and out and they can give you those talking points. Yeah. And I would just say that, you know, if you were to use either one of those systems, um, that you can get those talking points delivered to you on a silver platter where you can, you know, where you've got this system in place where you can make those connections. So I just thought I'd drop that in there. Um, but if not, then what I would say is you have to keep listening and you have to you have to start connecting the dots between what they're saying and the thing that you have. For me, with the group lesson system, um, for me, it was I addressed that practice concern because of how I was how I was handling practice in my own studio. 
which was because I had the kids there longer. This is very simple. Because the kids were there longer, they were actually leaving with most of their music learned in their first year. Mm. And so the practice at home was actually, and I could honestly say this, it was easier for kids to practice at home once I switched to a group lesson program that kept the kids there for a while versus when they were in one-on-one lessons with me. So I could plausibly say that and the parent, and it was believable. And then I would start telling stories of kids in the studio. Yeah, no, well, I, I, you're, you're, what I hear in that story um, is that you were listening Mm -hmm. to parents who were coming to you over and over saying like, here's one of my main concerns. My kid's not going to practice. My kid's not going to practice. And, and I just already, I'm already fighting. What do we hear? I'll, we're already fighting over homework. I don't want to fight over music. Music can't be a fight, right? So you actually ended up designing, in part, your program and your solutions around what you kept hearing over and yeah. over in your in your enrollment calls, right? Which is which is honestly like that's that virtuous feedback, right? It, sh- it should actually work that way. Yeah. Um, the, okay. the the dark side of this is that if you don't have an answer for this. I don't know what to tell you. Like if you as a studio owner don't have a way to solve that practice challenge, you actually don't have something that you can tell that person. And so that is a gap. That is a weakness in in your sales process. But it's not because you're bad at sales. It's because you haven't solved your customer's problem yet. And I have to say this. This is pretty strong language. But if you haven't solved your customer's problem yet, you're not going to do as well in business as if you have. Well, and also you can look at um, there's real simple metrics, right? When we're looking at our studio, one is like, how many leads are you getting in a month? Mm-hmm. You got 30, let's say, or you got 10 in a month and only one of them has enrolled. Well, likely there's a lot of time you need to spend contemplating whether or not yeah. you have a long-term solution for these people that are, I agree. That are inquiring. You know? mm-hmm. Okay, so we're moving through stories we are moving through fears and we're coming to a solution and, and you, you have basically a pretty straightforward call to action, right? You right. Close yeah. Your, your sales call with. Yeah. And so basically, you know, I've, I, I've shared a little bit there. I've done a little bit of my spiel, a little bit of my, you know, pitch. They've heard, I've specifically addressed one thing that they've said not thinking that, oh, you know, unless I address this, they're not going to come in for the trial. They won't sign up. Like, it has felt mostly conversational at this point. It's almost mm-hmm. felt like two friends chatting, not me like, okay, right. yes, I'm taking detailed notes on everything you're saying. It does feel very conversational, very casual. And then it's just like, I get to a point where I'm like, um, I've asked some questions about the child, what their goal is. I've just told a casual story. I'm like, you know, hey, this sounds really good. Um, I think probably the next best thing would just be, you know, do you want to come in? And um, a lot of times parents started the call by saying that they wanted the free trial. So we already knew we were working towards that. But, you know, again, I've led the call by saying like, hey, I'd like to get you know, get to know you a little bit better. And so then that parent says, you know, all those things. And then I respond by saying like, you know, this sounds like um, it'll be really good. You know, I do these trials so that um, you can really make sure that this is a good fit for you. Right. You know, that, that things jive between me and Sarah. Um, and it's really just kind of a risk-free way for you to come in and just make sure that, you know, that, that this works for you. And I mean, it was pretty casual. They always said yes to me. I, I don't have any like heavy duty tactics other than what I said here. Again, going back to what I said at the beginning, sales versus selling lessons, if you're doing this right, it feels like a friendly chat. Yes. Totally. Yeah. But and you so, do have a, yeah. You do have a concrete ask at the end where you're like, come in for a trial. Did you just have a simple schedule or would you, would you capture the time date right then on the call or do you like, I'll text you a oper- yeah. you know, schedule? What, what was your last? How did you get them to actually make a commitment to fix lot of in? Yeah, a lot of times I would send the trial calendar in an email beforehand, but then also set up the call. Sometimes I came to that call with them already being on the trial calendar, and I still did this whole thing because I wanted to meet them and learn about them. And, you know, and then, and then if they hadn't done that beforehand, a lot of times 
I had a calendar pulled up and I just asked them, Hey, um, I can read off a couple times for you right now. Is that okay? Sometimes they said yes, but a lot of times they said, I'm going to have to check my calendar and I'm in the car right now. Or, or they would say, well, Hey, let me check my calendar. Or I would ask if I got the sense that they were actually going to do it. If I was concerned that they weren't going to do it, I would try to do it over the phone and I would literally fill out the form on my computer for that. Um, for them exactly yeah totally if i had a confidence that they were going to do it i would just send them the link and say hey you could just pick the time on there so it, it real that again was gut instinct based on how the conversation went and that's the thing i can't teach you know but the beauty is the reason i got good at it is because i kept doing it the same way over and over and that's what i want to again go back yeah. to from the beginning i did it over and over the same way because if I did it over and over the same way, everything that happened was statistically significant. And I could see patterns over time. Whereas if you're just winging it every time and you don't have a specific process, you don't learn anything. You can't learn because there's no structure. Well, you can't assess what what isn't yeah. working within the process yeah. because you don't have a, you you can't go back and look at that. Yeah, that's a better um, way of putting it. Yeah, and. I just think that last piece is super important to me in my experience at the factory, which is that um, everybody's busy and it's, uh, uh, you know, like they say, like once you get a credit card, you get a commitment, mm -hmm. you know? So we've just, we've just always been trying to refine that very last step of being like, what's going to get them, what's going to get a busy parent to commit to showing up, to getting their child to add this next activity yeah. of which they already have a bunch, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that that last piece is important. Like, yes, be willing to actually literally fill out the form and enroll their child for them or be willing to text them the link right away. So say when they get done driving, that they'll just book that, book that trial. Yeah. Or I loved your tip where you're like, even before the call, you sent them the schedule for the trial. Yeah. You're like, Oh, by the way, in your box is the schedule. So Nate, I think there's a lot of overlap between the phone call, that initial contact. And I think there's a lot of overlap with how you do the quote unquote sales process for a trial lesson. Hmm. And so to talk about the trial lesson, I think instead of just going beat by beat through there, I think just to make, to end the episode in kind of an interesting way, I'd rather just talk through how I did the trial lesson. Yep. Like, here's what I would actually say. So I'm going to simulate as if I'm in a trial lesson, have just finished it, and now I'm talking to the parent. Okay, dig it. Love yeah. It. And so the similarities between there is that we're still trying to build rapport. We're going to do that when they first come in. I'm going to talk about that. You're going to see a lot of the same thing. You're going to see stories again. You're going to see me being curious about what the parent wants, although it's going to feel a little bit different because I have all the initial information they gave me. You're going to hear me kind of just rapidly go through some of those those uh, those points that I made earlier, you know, understanding them, gathering data, bringing emotion stories, all that. But instead of asking for the trial, now we're asking them when they want to begin lessons. So that sounds good. I can kind of just jump into it. Yeah, let's let's jump in. So the, just to frame it, the trial lesson is now over and you're basically moving to the finish line with the parent. Yes. Okay, yeah. dig it. Yeah, what fire. I do. And and I am going to talk a little bit about the trial itself, but I do want to just make a parenthetical statement here, which is that there are some people who don't do a trial. I was literally just talking to a client today. They don't do a trial. They do a phone conversation mm. and then they go straight into a kind of a trial period. It's very similar to what you were talking about yeah, earlier yeah, in the episode. We earlier. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that, that even if this isn't what you do, if you don't do a trial lesson, you are going to do some of the things that I'm doing here in the phone conversation. Cause you've right. got to, you've got to connect with these people at some point. You're, they're not just going to come in for the free, uh, all access pass or the risk free registration, you know, without, having had some sort of human contact. I mean, it will happen occasionally. You will have the email conversation and they're just so eager to begin. But again, my recommendation is even if it is that easy, still make an effort to have that human connection via phone or Zoom prior to them coming in. That way, um, 
you can do a little bit of screening and you can give them enough information to truly value and appreciate you. So. Having said that, let's just, let's get into it. So when they first get to the studio, you know, going to greet them and there is that awkward moment. It's like you greet the parent and then here's this small child, you know, or maybe not so small child, you know, they might be six, they might be 11. Um, but you've got to forge that initial connection with them. And a lot of times I didn't drag this out. I wasn't cringy, <laughs> you know, I would just say, Hey, I'm Mr. Daniel. I'm really excited to show you how to play some music today. Why don't you come on in? And, you know, we'd walk into the studio room. And I'd say, hey, I'm going to have you sit here in the hot seat. And I'd point at the, the piano bench right in front of the main piano that they'd be on. And then I would always start by asking them a question. Have you ever played music before? Have you ever taken a music class? Now, this is going back to kind of that idea of building rapport where I want to give them easy questions to answer. And so I'm going to ask that kid a series of easy to answer questions. And I'm keep, this is so important. And we're going to talk about this. I think there's another episode in us, Nate, where we just talk about the common mistakes that studio owners make or teachers make in a, in a trial lesson situation. Love and it. part of the reason why I'm building rapport in this way and keeping it really fast paced, I'm talking fast, I'm keeping the energy high, is that suddenly the child is really connected. They're, 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 they're looped into what I'm doing and it's, they're not getting distracted or bored. They're in a brand new environment. Right. They've got a piano with a bunch of buttons in front of it. Cause I always use digitals. There's a bunch of stimulus all over the room. They're seeing things in the walls. They're seeing, yeah. you know, little prizes over there in that corner. They could be really distracted. So I'm asking them questions and then I'm moving into the trial. I am not going to talk about how I did a trial. That's a whole different can of worms. Okay. After they're done, I would turn to the parent and, and, you know, I would say in 10 years, I never had a child fail to do the trial really, really well. I, as scripted as about, is what you're about to hear, I had my trial lesson scripted out as well, like all the beats, same things. And there was a high degree of uniformity between what a student could do. The only variance was a younger child would take about 18 minutes to get through that pre planned set of steps and learnings and outcomes. And an older child would get through in about 13 to 14 minutes. That was really the only variance. So I would turn to the parent after that. This child has just learned anywhere from five to eight songs in front of them, depending on the age of the child and where I decide to stop. And I would always ask the same thing. I would turn to them and I'd say, okay, well, you know, well, I would ask the question a minute. I would start by saying, hey, they did really well. Now that wasn't canned for me because they always did. You know, if they, mm. if they ever didn't, I don't know what I would actually do there. Although there was one time I did, I know I'm getting a little distracted here, but there was one time I had a family come in with two of the most poorly behaved children I think I've ever met. And I literally just spent the entire time wrangling those two kids. It was the only time it really happened. A lot of times I screen those people out over the phone first, but mm. these people slipped through the net. It was like the one time that it happened. And I happened to be recording it. Because I was wanting to record uh, a trial lesson video for one of my team members who was teaching lessons for me at the time. And I wanted right. to show him how to do it. And it just so happened that I got it on video. Oh, I watched it later. It was a disaster. It's almost comical. I think I still have the recording. Getting a little distracted. But I thought, you know, let's amuse the, <laughs> let's amuse the listeners and watchers here for a second. Anyway, so they did really well. And, you know, I just have a couple observations to make. And I would, I would point out now for an older child, this is almost always true, but I would point out specific things for younger children. I'd say one of the things I noticed, I didn't ever really have to repeat anything twice. That's actually a really good sign. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you for 90% plus of the kids who come to my studio, I actually wouldn't have to. So I wasn't just saying this. It wasn't just a script. It was actually true, but it's what I expected to happen. It's what usually did happen. It was very rare. Every mm -hmm. once in a while you get a child that maybe I had to do like repeat a set of instructions more than once. I might have a child that was getting distracted and I would always do the same thing to control th the environment. If I told them to do something, they didn't do it or they were pressing buttons or something like that. I would get really calm and I'd say, I would just in, in a very neutral, calm tone of voice, just say, could you put your hand here? And if they were ignoring me, I'd say, could you put your hand here? And if they kept, in, I would repeat it seven nine, 11 times until everybody in the room was feeling uncomfortable. And now the parents are starting like, Hey, Hey, you need to do what he's saying. Like, but I wouldn't react very important to show the parent who's in, in control here. 
And mm. that rarely failed to work where I did that. The only time I can remember is those two kids I was mentioning earlier. Um, so, so wait, hold on. I'm going to pause yeah. there for a second as you're moving sure. through, because I know you're moving to the close. Like right. you can feel it moving to the close. But what's the, dude, what's the why behind being sure that you're showing who's in control? If you can frame this in terms of the sales sure. process. Yeah. Like just help us understand why that piece was important in your model. Because underneath every business or sales transaction, there is a human interaction that's going on. And this goes beneath the higher brain where we're intellectual and we're rational and we're making decisions, that sort of thing. And it goes to the lower brain um, that uh, Paul McLean kind of call, calls the primitive brain that whoever controls the social interaction controls the financial transaction. And I'm 100% showing everybody in that room without having to be dom dominant, without having to be rude, without having to be overbearing. I'm showing everybody in that room who's in charge. Mm, fast. Okay, that's super interesting. Whoever controls mm -hmm. the social interaction controls, controls the financial the transaction. Yes. Wow, dig and it. So okay, and so these parents... Well these parents have to understand that they are 100%, they can 100% trust that their child is going to get a really good result here. And if I can't mm. even control simple behavior with their child, how in the world am I going to teach them a yeah, complex totally. skill like piano? That's, so that's those, a, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, it's a super subtle variation on sort of the idea of a classroom management or a, in my case like i think about the community room management like parents are observing all the time when we're doing these communal mm -hmm. games and drum circles and all these things and i've never actually framed it in that way like how are they supposed to develop the confidence that we can bring them on a seven to ten year journey if we yes. can't even control the room 100 percent seven to ten minutes <laughs> I'm so tempted okay. to tell a story here, but I think we'll save it for a future episode. Just things I've observed, again, things I've observed with studio owners or teachers who have really poor trial close rates. And this is, this is an area where there's so many ways to get this wrong. But I think yeah. we can save that. Yeah. We, there's probably a whole other episode there. I feel like anyway. we got like, like how to yeah. do that. Because I just actually literally pulled up our trial lesson map, which yeah. is a minute by minute. Try a yes. So I feel like we have a different episode here. So anyways, let's get okay. to the close here. I like that. Yeah. For the benefit of our listeners who have been for hanging sure. tight with us for a while. So I make observations about how the child did. I point mm -hmm. out subtle things, subtle things that the parent wouldn't have known to value, such as I never had to repeat myself twice. When mm -hmm. I did this, they did this. Mm -hmm. A lot of my best students do that. I make several comments like that. Then I make a sudden shift trying to keep the energy high, keep them, keep them guessing, keep their attention. I'll say, so something I want to tell you is, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I literally, I would do it the same way every time I'd point at the stand and I'd say, you see that book right there? According to the publisher, that book on average is a six to seven month book. Uh, a lot of studios have noticed that their students take nine months to get to that book. On average, students in my studio are getting through that book in about four months. And I want to mm. tell you why they do, why, why students are getting through those books so fast. So I do things here a little bit differently than most studios do, uh, do lessons. The typical way that a music teacher teaches lessons is that student comes into the lesson, the teacher teaches them a bunch of facts, and then they send the student home to figure it out on their own. We do not do that here. And I'll pause dramatically. We don't do that here. The way we do things in this studio is that students for their first year, learn all their music with me. Now, I remember when we talked on the phone, you said that you took lessons. Here's why that is such a big deal. Because the experience that you had and that I had growing up with a music teacher, with a piano teacher, was that we had to go home and figure it out on our own. And what that meant was, is that for 167 and a half hours a week, I was doing it wrong. And then I'd come back to the studio and find out once again, I was doing it wrong. And now I had to unlearn everything that I had previously learned. And so the teacher would then show me. And by the way, I did it this way earlier in my career. And I saw that with my own students. And I just got sick of that. So what I do now is I have the students learn the music with me. And then when they go home, they're not practicing. They're not having to figure it out on their own. They're actually rehearsing 
what they already know. It's review, not a new concept. They're actually just reviewing, which is much easier for kids, which is why kids in the studio don't really struggle with practice. Mm. So the parents are like, and I mean, I'm not kidding when I say this. I would see parents start to lean forward in their seat versus kind of the more passive, like just, you know, checking their phone. Like if it's a, if it's a husband and wife, the husband's on his phone, like goofing around the wife's like, you know, nudging him, like pay attention, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah totally. Uh, but I could tell the energy was there. And then that's where I kind of went into, and maybe I won't dwell on this so long, but you know, I did group lessons the last 12 years that I was still teaching and that's where I introduced the group lesson format at that point. Of course, they're already in my group lesson lab. They see five pianos in the room. They've totally. probably put two and two together. But I've connected the result that I'm getting, and I led with those outcomes. And then now I'm connecting to the format because typically parents were skeptical of group lessons. But in 10 years, I never had a single beginning student reject my group lesson program by doing the trial that I'm saying right now, which again... I've heard and I've seen on like the Facebook forums where a lot of studio owners and music teachers hang out. You know, I've seen the debate rage for seven, eight years now of like whether you should do a trial or shouldn't do a trial with the people saying that you shouldn't do a trial, basically making the comment that like, oh, it undervalues your skill. You're giving away something for free. But my thought was if I can actually get them to come in and see me work my magic and then go through this sales pitch they will be customers for life. And by and large, yeah. the people in my studio stayed a long time. And I will directly point at this sales process, not as something that was necessary to secure the, the sale or to secure the student. Um, the parents were almost already there when they walked over the, you know, over the studio threshold, the, the door of the studio. Right. Going through that process made them so believe in what their child was going to go through. So believe in me. And it taught them to value what I was doing by infusing everything that they had just seen. And what I was describing was going to happen to the child, infusing it with like this deeper meaning, because I'm actually comparing and contrasting what their child's experience might've been if they hadn't found me. So those yes. parents often really, really valued my studio and me. And a lot of times I was getting referrals from parents like within weeks of them starting just because they would pick their child up and they would just be praising me and like, oh, they're playing so much at home. They're so excited. Of course, I had to deliver on the goods and my first six weeks of lessons with the kids were highly scripted as well. So those kids were just boom, 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 learning songs left and right, going home with 10 songs each week, you know, delivering on the promise that I'd made there. So by the time, and we're getting close here to the end of the script, or we're getting close here to the end of the, um, the the points I'm making. By the time I got done with all that, explaining the format, explaining how it worked, I didn't even have to ask them if they were interested. Like I could see the desire on their faces to move forward. And so then it was really more just, um, so the way that we get started is I have slots available on my calendar. And really, you just have to pick the slot that works best for you. Um, do you mind if I throw a few out there and we can just figure that out now? Most of the time, the family would do that. And I would have my schedule pulled up and I could name it. And so then I would write down what they picked and I would send them right. a follow-up email later that night. In the in the event that like, oh, well, I need to talk to my husband. We need to figure, you know, we weren't ever going to make a decision here tonight, but I'm telling you we're going to start. I just need to talk to my husband, tell him what I saw here, or I need to talk to my wife, tell her what I saw here, and then we'll get back to you we would negotiate this over email. Do you mind if I put in one little uh, bullet point here or, or subscript footnote? Yeah, do it. I, and then I'm going to reframe one thing you said. And then, okay. Cause I love how you're closing. It's so simple. You're like, here are the options, which one yes. works. Tell us what works best for you. Yeah. And you get that resistance point, which is like, actually I have to talk to my husband. Nobody ever likes it when you hear that right. because you want to get to close, right. but you're just like, no problem. I'll follow up with you in an email tonight and we'll make the choice that way. You're still right. giving like a concrete, there will be an email that you need to respond to, but what's your, what's your additional bullet on this? Yeah, I'm going to hit that, but I, I do want to point out something that you just pointed out and that way of me asking when they want to pick, that's actually in sales training. That's, um, that's a technique called assuming the sale. So uh, you nice. ask a question that assumes that they're already going to say yes. That's actually yeah. a closing technique that salespeople use. Um, I don't know if I was doing that before I took sales training or after, 
but I didn't do it to be, I didn't do it thinking that that technique or any technique that I've used here, I, I didn't think, oh, that's what's going to get it. At the, at the end of the day, it was always going to be, can I believably demonstrate that what they want, they're going to get here. That's really the bottom line. All the sales tactics, yeah, mm -hmm. they make they make it easier for them to say yes, and it makes the social environment a little more uh, conducive to to things flowing really, really well. But if they didn't believe me, all the sales tax in the world wouldn't do anything. So uh, just put that little idea out there. But the footnote is that if I got to the trial and I didn't want to work with the family, which didn't happen very often, but if I didn't, if they somehow got through my my first filter and they'd actually gotten in for a trial, I the way that I would end the lesson was I would say, okay, so cool, you've got all the information, but instead of offering them times in the calendar, I would ask them when they were available. Mm. And they would give me their availability. And I would say, well, let me check against my calendar and I'll email you later and let you know how that lines up. And then Magically, oh, you know, our, our availabilities just don't match up here. Let me recommend another teacher here in the area. I don't know if that's like kind of skeezy or not, but like, I just hated, I mean, it would be very awkward if just the lesson be like, yeah. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. I don't think I it's going to work. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> I had to repeat myself too yeah. many times with your child. Yeah. A lot of times it was more like, cause it was behavior issues. Yeah. Um, the, the main, the so, number one reason that I would reject a student was just behavior issues. If I knew that they wouldn't fit into the group environment that I was trying to create, cause I'm trying to protect the culture that I have in my groups, not with yeah, the parents, yeah, but totally. with the kids, I'm trying to protect that culture I built with the kids. If they were going to disrupt that, be a distraction, be a, 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 a lowercase T threat to the other kids, then I didn't want them in, in there. And I didn't want to be the one. I mean, I've just met this family. I'm not going to be the one to explain that their child's a nightmare, you know? So I would just kind of do that technique and, and then follow up with them later and give them some numbers of other people. Cause I mean, you know, maybe this other teacher in a one-on-one -on -one environment could actually do really well with that child. Yeah, yeah, maybe totally. that child needed the one-to-one -one, um, uh, contact. And so I would actually follow up sometimes and see if, if they actually did reach out to that teacher. Most of the time they didn't. It's kind of interesting. So, so let me let me maybe I can wrap this up in a bow by because I just love the way you got to the point of here are the options on the calendar. Let me know which works best for you. The first is you pointed a book. So I have no idea if this is part of sales training, but I know it to be true at the factory. You used a prop, right? Props are really important. We oftentimes will point at the big screen and be like, Th those are our games, big music games. We'll point at props all the time. So you use a prop because a prop validates you, right? You're not making this up. You're actually referencing something. And in this case, you were referencing whatever, your, whatever the methodology you guys were using at the time. Um, and then the second thing you do that I love is you go, you told the story, which is essentially your unique selling proposition. You just went straight into what differentiates your studio from the other by saying, here's what normally happens with that prop, but it doesn't happen here. You know, so it's sort of like um, step one is reference something external so that it isn't just all about you. Step two is say, but when you add you, when Daniel plus prop work together, guess what? it's a radically different experience than what they'd expect elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and I kind of love that. It's like, I think we all understand the term, like, you know, how do you differentiate your studio? What's your unique selling proposition? All these things. But sometimes it's hard to actually put it into real um, practice, you know? And the last thing I would say is, you and I, dude, you and I talk all the time about purpose, values. You've talked about this really clearly in previous episodes where, your definition of success was your um, your rate of completion. You would literally be like, look, over the school year, we move through the book twice as fast as a normal yep. program. And then you were like, and by the way, in my summer book blasts, we move through them four times as fast right. or 10 times. Yeah, so, 10 times more, yeah, probably closer. 10x. So you're literally saying like, this is my differentiator. I will move your child quickly through material. Um, and I just love that. I think it's important because 
you know, our listeners don't have to be like, I don't, hopefully they won't walk away being like, our differentiator needs to be that we move fast through material. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. Yeah. The point is, is that you're like, for you, that was really important and you were really good at it. Mm -hmm. You built your entire culture around it. Yeah. You know, and so you, in the, in your sales process, that's where you ended. Mm -hmm. Which I, I, I love that piece. I love the way you do it too. I love the way you get to at home. They're only going to be rehearsing what they already know. It took me a long, yeah, yeah. it took me a long time to come up with some of those lines. And I think to close out at least the last few comments I would want to make, I'd point out a few things by harkening back to things that were said earlier in the episode. Earlier in the episode, I made reference to controlling the outcome And how you can't get better at the process if you allow variability into it, that it has to largely be the same each time. It's been four years almost since I've done that trial lesson script. Mm. And it just came back to me like that because I did it largely the same for about the 10 years before it. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so... Again, I think there's another episode here where because w- w- I, I dug into some of the subtleties of that of the script and why I was doing things, but there's actually even more going on underneath the surface. I think we could do a whole episode on like the five things that most studios do wrong in their sales process, yeah. especially the trial lesson aspect of it, because I barely begin to scratch the surface of of the problems I've seen most studios have. Um, and, and what I want to say is that w- what was just heard there has been tested over a very long period of time, even down to the tone of voice and the word choices and where I pause, it was largely the same. And I didn't sit and practice in a mirror. It just came because I did a lot of trials every year. And then I was, I was deliberately choosing to try to make them the same. And so you don't have to memorize the script. You don't even have to write it out. I never did, but you do need to commit to trying to do it the same and test to see if it's working and test, be very aware of your surroundings, be aware of how the child is relating to you, how the parents are relating to you, what their body language is, and you'll know whether they're engaged or not. 